So back when I was like 16, a friend and I used to mess around with a Ouija board. We were both practicing Wicca, even though we didn't know what the fuck we were doing at all. And we found things like this fun. So she'd come over one night, and when she'd gone to the bathroom, and of course, naive young May was still a little bit suspicious of the authenticity of our session, and thought our friend was just moving the planchets. So she decided to play on her own, and when it pulled harder than she'd ever felt and started to spell, she obviously said goodbye and freaked out. Fast forward a while, I had started having sleep paralysis and semi-awake hallucinations of this guy in my room. Now at first, it was kind of how most people describe a shadow person, just kind of a shape with no detail. But after a while, it began to look more and more like a person. I had done a lot of research into it and could never really find out what it was, because it never really did much, but I knew it was there and real. And one night, after a particularly bad fight with my family, I went to sleep crying. Immediately, when I fell asleep, I got the paralysis and felt something like holding me from behind. I freaked out and woke myself up and cried some more. It was so weird to me. Now for a long time, I thought I'd made this shit up in my head due to trauma from my abusive family. That was until my f over Christmas, when I was with my mother's, with the sibling that now stayed in the room that I'd stayed in. I began to ask questions about a shadow person or demon that had been causing him some problems. Now this brother is not a liar. He also really doesn't believe in paranormal things, so when he came to me claiming that something resides in the room, that throws things at him, scratches him in his sleep, had knocked over his fish tank, throws the closet doors off the rails, the little track thingies on the frame, and just causing chaos, I was quick to think back about my experience with the shadow man. Also to him, it looked like a shadow, not the man I'd seen. It was very tall and had long fingers, no detail again. Also, when I say it looks like a man, I mean that it's kind of like if you outlined a person and pressed the fill with a paint bucket in Photoshop. Like that shadow of a person, but like 3D. I don't know, this probably isn't the best way to describe it. I don't know what it could be. I don't know what, think it's a demon or eventual spirit, because it never did anything crazy like that to me. I'm not sure what it could be. You guys can think I'm lying or whatever, but this is 100% true. And I didn't even believe it for a long time until my brother brought it up to me. My parents divorced when I was four, and my dad went to build his own house while I lived with my mom. My dad built this house on a site where the previous home had burned down three years earlier. It was arson, but no one was hit or killed and the perpetrator never caught. Shortly after finishing the house, weird things began to happen. The first story is one I wasn't told until I was older. One night after the house was finished but not fully moved into yet, my dad was working late upstairs in the master bedroom. It was probably midnight or so, and he was finishing up when he began to hear voices. He described it as a group of people talking. He wouldn't make out any single conversation, just the general buzz of many voices coming from downstairs. Confused, he left the bedroom and stood on the landing, listening. The voices didn't stop, and they were coming from the living room. My dad grabbed a wrench, the only thing he had, and changed downstairs only to find nothing. However, the voices were still talking. He entered the living room and stood there, listening. He said it sounded like the voices were coming from the ceiling, like the group of people was super tall or something. He began to get scared and shouted at the voices to shut up, which they did. It just fell completely silent. My dad left for the night pretty quickly afterwards. The next thing is something I remember. Sometimes when my sister and I stayed over at my dad's, we would spend half a week with our mom and half a week with our dad. The smoke detector in our room would go off in the middle of the night. 
It never happened when we were with our mom, only when we were in the bedroom asleep at night with our dads. The smoke detector in our bedroom was also the only one to go off. No other detectors in the house would do anything. My dad tried replacing the battery and even replacing the whole thing, but it would continue to happen for a few years. I remember waking up in the night to the alarm blaring and running to my dad's room to tell him the alarm was going off again. This happened once a month or so for the first few years we lived in that house. Finally, this is something my entire family witnessed. We had motion detector lights on the stairs leading to the basements. One night we were in the living room which had a perfect view of the stairs to the basement. We had a sheet in the doorway at the time because my dad just hadn't put a door in yet. Suddenly, the motion lights on the stairs turn on and the sheets move up, like someone lifted it to walk under and then let it go. Except, there was no one there. I remember being super freaked out, but my dad didn't seem worried, so I wasn't either. Years later, my dad told me he was actually terrified, but didn't want to scare my sister and I, so he pretended to be fine. The smoke detector was the only incident that kept happening, but after a few years, it stopped and nothing creepy happened in that house again. We moved out when I was 14 and I haven't been back since. To our knowledge, no one has died on the land or been buried there, so I'm not sure what this all was. Any feedback would be great. So I used to live in a council house before my mum moved in with stepdad. While living there, it was just me and my mum. I had three experiences living in that house. I'm glad to be out of there. Before I get to those stories, my former neighbour died while I was living in the place. The neighbourhood didn't know this until his garden started smelling and becoming untidy. He definitely didn't leave the house as one of us would have known. People knocked on his door to no avail. Eventually, the police were called and they broke into his house to find his body there. I can't remember how he died, but yeah, it may not be related to what happened to me. I'm a bit suspicious. Now, onto the experiences. So, once I had a late night, my mum went to bed and I went up like 5 to 15 minutes after. Anyway, I turned off my laptop and headed for the corridors. The doorway I was going to went to left. The kitchen, where besides that doorway was the front door and a staircase. And right, a little room where you top up the electricity with a key. I went left, obviously, since I was going to bed. Then the lights turn off, like some paranormal activity shit, and I saw a fucking white figure walking from the sink. I didn't full-on scream, but I did yelp, blinked, and everything was back to normal. When I think back to it now, I think that my mind was fucking with me. I'm a superstitious person, but I'm thinking of a rational explanation. But then, this experience... Oh, mighty God, this experience. So I was in bed, like 2 or 3 a.m., and I get out of bed for a piss, and before going into the toilet room, it's one of those bathrooms with a toilet only, I peek into my mum's room, and there's a fucking hand looming over my mum's head. And when I looked, it disappeared. Mind you... Nobody was in that fucking house but us. I, being the dumbass I was, went to the bloody toilet before warning my mum and said pissing myself. I used to work as a guide and then as backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but when I worked in Utah, it was in the West Desert south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert, called Indian Canyon. The spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or early 1900s, some enterprising pioneer families had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of the little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling rotten ruin. 
The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago. And what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of grey wood scattered all over the near vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but further down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as Backup. A new position I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and the spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or that people weren't dead was because we were lucky. Not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24-7, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it works in theory, anyway. One of the boy groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon, in the foothills about two miles away from me. The other is just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon, on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road, branching off of the main dirt road, running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away. Though to drive to them, I'd have to back out to the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot. Maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being headed up by my wife Jessica. Divorced now. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys group and the girls group, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building pack packs and gathering fire sets, and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week, and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of, and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with, and arranged them in a ten foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor in the sand. I bent them into a dome four feet high and ten feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking it. I walked down to the truck which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away and hauled a large bin of tarps and cow hides and plastic sheeting along with my fire sets and some other gear up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek I remember feeling like someone was following me but when I stopped and looked, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high, wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off, and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' group in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it to be as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we would go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time, but mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. 
And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets. It's a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through it. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire, and then rolling into the lodge, and I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too much for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load, because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before, and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there, through the flat, soft, dry land. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling of being watched came back, only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out in the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but it suddenly crackled to life. Brian and the boys group doing some evening check-in a little early, so they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a can in the center of the fire, and then just piled all, all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly big, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight towards me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my ten foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go get Katie and Jess. No one will be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will. He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? It's nothing, I said. I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place and I remember leaving it, is all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird. He said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress about it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after. Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my little sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five gallon water jugs I hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possible bag. A possible bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail that we call possible bags to disguise the fact that we're in fact grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. 
Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We'll do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives. Our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it's important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I'd made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we'd found it best to not let kids or people new to the wilderness know, because it could become a distraction from the experience if they got too caught up in our personal lives. So a side hug was all. And as far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I looked out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision to not go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I'd end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge. Ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, but off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I'd join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream, about a hundred yards, and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least ten minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left, and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up in the trees. I stared hard and could not at first see anyone, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, thirty or forty feet away. Too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me, and the longer I stood there, the worse I felt. Like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath and did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough. I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road when I heard all of the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold, and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off, and they and the hides that were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar, and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up. And we started talking a little about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. And we had just poured some water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold. Like, really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us. Frame and all and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them it was a microburst windstorm and that they happen sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky no one got hurt and so on. And amid sceptical looks from the three of them who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp. But Katie stayed. 
Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out there, knew what I was doing. She could tell. I wasn't saying something. The fire is out, like it's cold out. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying, Dan? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a little Native American girl who can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up. But I set down that really big rock, the first one you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes, and when I returned, it was over by the creek. Like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks and it couldn't have rolled there. Then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I'd chased her for about 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up there. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three in the morning, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and wouldn't drop it till we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up. So I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh. He's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the tree above me. And there was this little native girl with two braids and a blue slash gray headband up in the tree over my face staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt someone reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but curious as to why. He told me he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. That's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised I heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about his horrible dream about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. That's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us. And Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everyone that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is onto it apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie, it's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week.
There was a house in my area that burnt down several years ago, when I was still a child and living in my old house. There were no reported deaths, but I beg to get differ. When I was around 12 years old, and whilst the house was still relatively fresh from the fire, me and a friend decided to go inside and explore it for whatever reason. There was an unlocked window which we climbed through, and although my memory is a bit hazy, I do remember the staircase being black and ashen, the walls and ceiling ripping apart, etc. I also remember walking into a room, which looked like a child's room. There was a framed picture of two girls, some family photos and whatnot. Me and my friend left soon after. The house got remodelled, and frankly, I forgot about it. Cue a few years later. Me and my family moved from our old small house into a new two-story house in our area that we still live in to this day. And you guessed it, it's that same house that burnt down. Now, things were fine for a few years. I didn't experience anything weird. That, however, changed around two years ago when I began seeing and hearing things, mainly in my room and occasionally around the house as well. It started off with voices, especially when I was going to sleep. I have no history of any mental health issues, so this was a new occurrence to me. I'd be lying on my side, trying to go to sleep, and I would hear a woman's voice singing into my ear. She would sing, whisper unintelligible things, sometimes speak to me, but I could never make out anything she was saying. It was the most surreal thing ever, because it would be as though she was right next to me, or above me. But every time I'd turn around to see who's there, nobody would be. This then escalated to hearing voices of two girls. It wouldn't be in my ear as before, and rather around the entire room. They would sing kids songs, rhymes, etc. I then began hearing constant knocking on my door, and the floor creaking in my room as though someone was walking around. I even called out a few times to see if anyone was there. I'd ask my sister if she was at my door, and she'd always say no. This went on for a while, before I actually began to see her. Not the kids, but the woman. I'd see her all the time, and they'd always be split second glances, and she would disappear. She would be in the creepiest places and positions too. A lot of the time, I'd see her in the corners of the ceiling in my room, right above my bed. On all fours, and clutching into the ceiling. I saw her like this as I walked past my sister's room as well. I'd see her walking down the stairs, head down, hand on the rail. Sometimes she would stand in my room and just look at me. Again, I would only ever see her for a second at most, but it's so vivid in my memory. Weird thing is, she's never scared me. Sure, the knocking and voices freaked me out at first, but when I began actually seeing her, There was no fear at all. It was quite calming, actually. I tried to talk to her sometimes, too. She'd obviously never respond. Nowadays, I haven't seen her much. The kids' chants have gone, but I still occasionally hear her whispering or humming into my ear when I'm about to sleep. I move rooms as well, so maybe that's why. Sometimes I do end up sleeping in my old room, and those are the nights where I hear her the most. My cat, however, still stares at the door and the ceiling, and at an empty spot in my room. Sometimes she hisses, sometimes she just meows. I've told my mum my experience, and my sister. Both haven't seen or heard her specifically, but they both believe me, and think something is wrong with the house. A couple of months ago, I moved into an old house, built in 1902, and I felt something was there. I just didn't know how active what I felt would be. At first it was small things, windows not being open or shut like how I left them, doors opening on their own, footsteps down the hallway when it was just my cats and I home. Like I said, small stuff, but things have grown more active in the past week. I've been poked and had someone say my name as if trying to get my attention. I went into my room right after and it got real cold, real fast. This was the first contact he attempted to make. The days following this, I felt an uneasy feeling, as if it was unwelcome and was being glared at. This feeling wasn't constant, but I could feel where it was coming from, which let me know where he was. 
Footsteps became louder. Banging could be heard throughout the day in various rooms. Although never my room. My cats seemed to love my room and often claw the door until I let them in. Once they got in my room, they refused to leave, hissing at the hallway as I get them out of my room. I believe there was just one spirit in my home, but last night left no doubt that there were at least two. I was laying down for bed, watching TV at a very low volume. All of a sudden, clear as day, right in my ear, Hey! I froze from the shock of a female voice loudly whispering in my ear. I keep watching my show, ignoring it. Then again, hey. More drawn out than the first time. I keep my eyes forward, but I see someone standing at the foot of my bed, out of the corner of my eye. She disappeared after a few minutes. She didn't feel malicious, but her energy definitely felt authoritative. A minute later, my cat started zooming as they do but I heard footsteps following theirs, and I was the only one awake. About one and a half years ago, I was home alone and had no pets at the time. Nice setup for a ghost I know. And no, it wasn't 3am, it was around 8pm if I remember correctly. I was sitting in my room watching a movie, with the door to my room closed as always. Suddenly, I hear the sound of the door handle being violently pushed down, and then I can already see the door slamming opening into the wall. After a sec of shock, I thought that my mom or sister were home already, so I called out for them, but I didn't hear anything, so I looked for them. But after a few minutes, I realised they weren't home yet, and the door was still locked. So I looked out of the window to see if they wanted to prank me, but no car was in sight. I checked everything that somehow could have caused the door handle to be pushed down and slammed open. But nothing is lying on the ground next to the bookshelf, nor are any windows open, so I couldn't even explain how the door even slammed open after that. I am and always have been a huge sceptic, but that is the one experience I was never able to explain. If some of you got any ideas on how that could have happened, I'd be thankful, since believing in ghosts didn't exactly make my fears disappear. Until the Apostle incident in 2018, I had never experienced anything paranormal in my life, much to my dismay. I wanted entities to present themselves to me, so I called for them. I was a weird kid. As I recall, I only ever asked though. I never taunted or tried to offend. I have some memories before the age of six, but six is really the age I remember becoming aware, self-aware, aware of the fact that other people process things differently. Basically had my first existential crisis. I was overweight even at six, and relentlessly bullied. Mom and dad had straight hair. I have extremely curly hair. Now I love it because I know how to maintain it after having some YouTube tutorials and the entire internet at my disposal. But as a kid with parents who had no idea about curly hair, I walked around with a rat's nest unless my mom French braided it. The bullies told me to brush it, so I did for hours which is why my hair was such a puffy, frizzy mess all the time. I digress. I was bullied relentlessly for my hair and weight. My parents were divorcing. I'm not even sure if I knew what suicide was at the time, but I do remember thinking that if I was dead, I wouldn't have to deal with this. I believe I was depressed at six years old in 2001, not just sad. It got worse in 2007 and worse again in 2015. Looking back, I legitimately don't know how I'm alive. For 19 years, suicide was my first thought waking up every morning. April 2018, my mom died. I was the one who found her, and she was my best friend, so it was rough. Tragedy followed. Dude, I was seeing ghosts, me, but in comparison to the other things, it seemed so trivial. My best friend overdosed to death and my Pompty dog was attacked and died in my arms. And in November 2019, I lost my job because I was essentially coming to work, 
getting very little actual work done, spending the day trying to hide constant crying and panic attacks in my cubicle. In any case, I was at rock bottom, just numbly existing. Didn't even have the desire to actively end my life anymore. I was just waiting for malnutrition or negligence to kill me. And then it all went away. 19 years of chronic suicidal depression, gone. I wish I could bottle it and sell it and end all the sadness in the world. I'm now one of the happiest people I know. I literally love life and wake up smiling every morning. To me, there's literally no explanation other than this crazy one that finally ties back into the paranormal. What if I had some sort of entity affecting me from a young age? I got to thinking of this because of a comment in this sub encouraging a poster to ward off the evil entities they felt as these entities can cause lifelong depression. That to us is purely that, depression. No paranormal overtones or vibes from it. When I Google ghosts causing depression, I'm encouraged to be evaluated for my mental health. But I've read a few interesting things that bore no Google results. When I try to dig deeper. I don't know if that's because commenters pull things out of their ass or they're just such niche topics. No one else is talking about them. What if my mom's spirit found the entity causing depression and took care of it for me? Is that possible? Is that plausible? Am I completely crazy and need to get help for even considering that this could be real? Did this happen in a book or movie that I forgot about and I'm now applying it to my life? My mom was my best friend and I her caretaker as she became wheelchair bound from a rare neurological condition when I was 14 in 2008. I was probably about 17 when this happened, so summer of 2012. I was up late with her, just talking and watching TV. This is Texas, so despite being 2am, it was still 90 degrees, and I decided to walk up to the gas station to get her some Cokes. I always enjoyed quiet, hot, late night walks to the gas station. It was peaceful, and I never felt scared because I'd made the trip hundreds of times. I passed an empty parking lot from about 50 feet away, and with the street illuminated by only nearby porch lights and the street lights, I clearly see a tiny pair of glowing greenish yellow eyes staring at me. A couple seconds later, several more pairs of glowing eyes turn on me, all just a few inches from the first pair. I never stop walking, but I maintain focus with the eyes until I'm out of range, for fear that whatever it is could charge at me. In my head, I was picturing a fat black cat, but it could have been a massive cat. On my way back from the gas station, it was gone. Back home, I recounted the eyes to my mom over cokes and snacks, and she was shocked to hear that I'd never seen a wild possum before, given how incredibly common they are to the area. She said they're all over the place in town, but stay hidden very well and act nocturnal. She said they can even have two dozen babies at a time. And that I saw a mama and her babies out on the prowl. And they were, of course, more scared of me than I was of them. I love animals and the possums are cute. So it absolutely made my day that I had seen this little family of opossums. I started looking them up on my phone. And my mum and I talked about them and read about them for several hours. Because that's just the kind of stuff we did together. In 2014, I moved across town into a house alone, but I'd still go see my mom every other day after work. April 4th, 2018, I found her peacefully passed in bed. Stage four kidney disease made its claim on my mom's life. The doctor that came to pronounce her explained to me that when an organ fails, it causes the heart to stop working and assured me that any pain is not long lasting and is a very quick way to go. 10 years of suffering due to the neurological conditions plus the kidney disease was more than I expected to get with my mom. She was ready to go long before that and I think she fought to stay for me but just couldn't suffer anymore. I had not seen an opossum since that night in 2012. Three days since my mom had passed and I was still in the shock stage. I was destroyed inside and I hadn't eaten or spoken to anyone 
Just cried and slept and stressed out about taking in my mom's dogs, which I was completely unprepared for, but did not trust anyone else to love and care for them. It was late, about 2 a.m., and hot. I had the dogs outside to go potty for a while and decided it was time to bring them in. After I got them in, I got the urge to turn back around and open the back door again and look outside again. So I did. The back wooden fence is only about eight feet away from my perch at the back door. To my right, about 10 feet away, there's a tree that grows at the corner of the fence and the branches hang down and cover the corner of the fence. From the branches, I notice a slight rustling, following the glare of glowing green eyes. Out ambles a fat opossum. It treks clumsily over the wooden fence, occasionally looking up and glancing at me. I'm frozen in disbelief. It reaches the point of the fence and directly across from me, stops and stares directly at me. I say hi, and it turns back the way it came and slowly makes its way and disappears back into the tree branch at the corner of my fence. Those are the only two times in my life I've ever seen an opossum. I think my mom had a short chance to say goodbye and bring me comfort as an opossum. My mom and I also loved birds. They were our favorite animal. We were going to move down south and be bird watchers when I retired. We knew she, she wouldn't live that long, but it was the fantasy we always dreamed of. My neighborhood is full of stray cats, so unfortunately, we don't get a lot of birds. A couple of weeks later, my bereavement leave from work ended. The very first day I went back to work, I stepped out the front door and walked up to the car to be distracted by the very distinct voices of two birds. I look directly up and on the power line above me is a blue jay and a cardinal sitting together. I had never seen a cardinal before and blue jays were a rare treat to get to see. But I hadn't seen so much as a crackling or sparrow in the neighborhood because of the cats. Maybe it's just the grief, but I feel as if my mom had something to do with the birds too. And it only adds to my belief that she intercepted a possum to say goodbye to me. I'll start by saying that my mom, grandmother and I are pretty familiar with the paranormal and that we've had our fair share of strange experiences to this day. I've always been someone interested in the paranormal, even though it scares me a bit. I've had many experiences since I was around six or seven years old, but I'll start by sharing with you guys something that happened to me three days ago. So here it goes. It was last Sunday. I just came home from my boyfriend's place at around eight o'clock at night. I went to my room to sit back and relax and decided to light a candle for a little ambience. All of a sudden, the candle flame became really tall and agitated. So much so that I checked if I had left my window open. It wasn't. My door was closed as well, so no possibility of a draft except affecting the candle. By saying that the flame was tall, I mean a good 15 to 20 centimeters long. Very unusual for a rather small candle whose mesh had been trimmed before. The fame flickered and stayed that long for minutes, never returning to its usual length and strength. I then decided to ask questions to see if the candle flame would react, since it has been said to me that when a candle flame does this for a long time, a spirit or presence is near. I started asking if anyone was there. The flame flickers a lot. I waited to see if it was a coincidence, but it didn't seem like it. I then had an idea. I have three pendulums that I use for divination. So I took one of the three, went back to the candle and asked again if anyone was there. The pendulum started moving clockwise, which means a yes. I waited for the pendulum to become steady again and proceeded to ask if it was someone I knew. There again, the pendulum started moving clockwise, so yes. I waited for it to stop moving and asked for if it was someone from my family and the answer I got was yes. I then asked if it was there to watch over my family and it said yes. Finally, I asked if it wanted to continue communicating with me and the pendulum started moving counterclockwise, meaning a no. I then thanked it and said goodbye. 
As soon as I said goodbye, the candle flame returned to normal, burning steadily with a length of two to three centimeters. For a good part of the night, I heard the floorboards just outside my room creaking, as if someone was there. Both my parents and my brother were already asleep, and my dog was in my parents' room. The next day, when I told my parents what happened, my dad was surprised and told me that our dog was pretty agitated for a part of the night, which wasn't usual for her. He said she seemed a bit scared of something. For the past four days now, starting on April 10th, whenever I'm sitting on my couch in the living room, out of the corner of my eye, I see a lady dressed in an all white robe. I usually dismissed it as a trick of the eye or a curtain flowing, but each time the family dog, who never barks at anything, rushes the door and goes insane. Every time I notice and turn my head to look, she's gone, except for one time I saw her and looked into her eyes. Her face was kind of her eyes. Not really eyes and not really face either. Also not really so much a female but feminine, but something alike to them. It was soft but dangerous, like this thing is powerful and yet gentle. I've grown up in a fairly religious Christian household and have always been really sensitive to spirits and general intentions. Ask me why I hate going to moat churches. Her intentions feel protective and I've only ever caught a glance of her as she paces our porch in front of our door. So I'm not so much scared of her, but scared of her presence and its meaning. I've tried to think of anything out of the ordinary, such as a new item in the house or a deviation from normal schedule or something. Anything really. But nothing. The only thing I can possibly think of is Friday, April 9th night, into Saturday, April 10th morning. There was a severe storm that blew down a really, really old tree in our neighbours across the street from us. Front yard. Before this, I was skeptical about paranormal stuff and didn't give it much credit, but kept an open mind. I have no dealings with witchcraft or rituals or anything to do with a Ouija board. My girlfriend has been supportive and has experienced many of the same things I have, and some of her own. In March of 2020, I bought my first home and everything was fine until a few months in. At first, it was confined to electronics powering off so I wasn't really clued into something paranormal at first. I'll spare you my list, but there were things moved around the house, doors found open, scratching heard in the walls, glass bottles on the fridge jingling, and the area fan in my bedroom was found turned on multiple times. The three instances that really make me uneasy are the ones I can't pin on the pets. Midwinter, I was at my gaming desk and all of a sudden, I got an intense campfire smoke smell. I immediately ran down to the furnace room, hoping nothing was on fire, but couldn't smell smoke anywhere else in the house. And it was gone when I returned to my room. I live in town, and the two adjacent neighbours do not have a wood-burning furnace. Just last week, I went to the kitchen to grab a soda, and at the bottom of the stairs, I smelled an intense lavender perfume. I asked my girlfriend if she had been ambitious with her mojo before leaving, and she hadn't applied any perfume that night. The smell lingered in a singular spot for a bit, and I haven't smelled the perfume or the campfire smoke since. The last is what happened last night. I worked the night shift and come home to get the dogs out on my lunch break. After letting the dogs out and eating in my office, I hear a muffled thud from downstairs. I immediately check where the cats are and they're right beside me begging for handouts. I dismissed it and finished my lunch. When I walked back into the kitchen, I found the little carpeted mat that sits in front of the oven, square in the middle of the kitchen. This I cannot explain away or pin on the pets as they were not in the kitchen at all. And the rug wasn't there when I walked in and made lunch. I'm from New York City. A week ago, my father's best friend of 15 plus years was murdered in a hit and run, and it made the news on the daily news website. 
I've seen and experienced the paranormal my whole life. Nothing quite like this. My dad's friend Jackie died tragically. He was run down by an impatient driver. The driver parked their car and left, leaving Jackie pinned under the car. He was dragged for 50 feet. It seemed like he was gonna survive, but he passed away at Bellevue Hospital. My father told me the news on Monday. I only met Jackie when I was a kid, 13. I'm 23 now. I had no connection to him, and I only knew him as my dad's best friend slash co-worker. I was distraught at first because my dad was in pain, and I've never seen him that way before. That same evening, around 10 p.m., I started to feel agitated, angry, and in denial. I knew I was feeling pretty neutral, but for some reason, I was angry and confused. I tried to brush it off and went to lie down in bed to relax. I'm wide awake. I suddenly become very cold, but the heat was on in my home, so I had no reason to be freezing. I then began to go numb and felt something enter my body. I heard his last two loud heartbeats and something left my body. I got up fast and I heard someone whisper and ask, why, in my left ear. I never experienced this before. And after that day, he hung around near me and in my home for at least two days. And I felt his emotions and all the stages of grief. Anyway, I wanted to share this experience. I've never really told anyone except for my mother and she has a gift where she can see, hear and talk to spirits better than I can. So she was able to validate my experience for me and had her own experience with Jackie as well. It's been a week since he passed and his funeral is later today. I hope he gets justice and they find the person who hurt him. When I was 11, our old home was haunted. We would see shadows, our things would move or go missing. We would get touched aggressively and we would hear people have conversations at night. But we lived in an isolated industrial area. We barely had neighbours. At 12 years old, my parents had taken me to a medium and she confirmed our experiences and even let us know that something dark was attached to us. At the same time, I was angry for no reason and I hated everything and everyone. I was also suicidal, even though I knew I loved life and my family. When I was outside the home, I actually felt normal and happy. I was getting attacked emotionally and physically. Something would try to pull my covers, so I would fall off the bed and I would wake up unaccounted for bruises. I was beat and I couldn't sleep anymore. If I did it, it was for a few hours. The medium had confirmed that this was a demonic entity and it was sent to us purposely. My family was suffering because we didn't know how to fight something we can't see. As the energy in our home got worse, my parents thought it was best that we move. We moved into a new home and it felt good to live in a place with good energy. A couple of months into our move, my dad decided to get his parents a visa to visit the US, even though he knew his parents didn't like us or my parents' marriage. He did his best to give them everything they didn't have. Also, my dad was in denial about his mother's feelings and behavior. They stayed in our home for six months when my grandma would make lunch. She didn't like when we ate her food. They took over my parents' room and told my mom to sleep on the futon. Of course, my mother swallowing her pride, she accommodated. My grandma didn't like when we would go into the room, our parents' room, because we were intruding. They finally left and activity started to pick up again. Again, we would see the shadows, but this time they would come out the mirror. The furniture would creak as if someone applied pressure to it, and you felt as if you weren't alone, even though you were. My mom had stated this is happening because of my grandma, but of course my dad didn't believe it. My mom and my sister began to talk, curse and scream while they're sleeping. I started to get sleep paralysis again and would get scratched in threes and I would have bruises again. I couldn't sleep or experience my new home in peace. My grandparents had visited again two more times. The last time, they waited till my dad was at work and they packed their things and left. Their excuse for that was my mom. My mom did her best even though they would belittle her in her own house. My dad was heartbroken 
because he was doing his best to provide and they disowned him. In 2019, my mom had traveled to Mexico to say her goodbyes to a dying cousin. People in the village had let my mother know that my grandma was a bruja, witch, and she was going known for doing bujeria, dark magic. And she would let people know that my mother wasn't the woman for her son. While my mum was gone, I was being attacked. Things were being thrown aggressively and photos of my mother fell off the shelf. Whatever was in our home was waiting till my mum was far away to hurt me and my little brother. When my mum came home, she let my dad know and she was devastated. He felt guilty because they were using him and because she was mean to us. We consulted another medium and she came to our home and confirmed that something was sent to our home to hurt us. We found out that my grandma had stolen some of our knickknacks. She had left her personal things in our house and hid them in the closet. And she also left dark magic work in our backyard, behind the shed and in the dirt. It turns out she had been cursing us for years, but we just can't seem to get rid of the work that she's done. I went to visit my grandma and she hugged me and cried crocodile tears because she missed me so much. I've been experiencing this since I was a kid and I'm 22 now. I know it's a demonic entity because I've seen it in its form and I've seen others too. They still haunt me and attack me to this day. They like to follow me from home to my boyfriend's house. When I sleep, they're in my dreams and they like to hold me down when I'm in sleep paralysis mode. I do my absolute best to protect myself spiritually and I feel less scared and stronger now. Whatever my grandma did is wrong, strong. But I was told that when one demon knows you, they all know you. I hate that this is my life and I don't seem to know anything else beside it and don't have anywhere to confide in.